I'm going to start with a, a brief presentation of the uh, of the project for those <coughs> who uh, doesn't know it, and then um, with a presentation of the uh, speakers. We, uh, the speaker we have today, um, Helena Daffern, um, and her talk on uh, virtual choirs. So. Um, this seminar series is an activity we are doing as part of the Art uh, Soundscapes project. The project deals with the sonic aspects of uh, the rock art uh, sites, focusing on the acoustics as an essential element of uh, these places, and how uh, this aspect could uh, have contributed to the uh, sacred and the religious motion of uh, prehistoric communities. Um, to to uh, tackle this um, objective, uh, the project has five uh, research lines. Um, we are our in, uh, interdisciplinary team formed by um, archaeologists, historians, uh, sociologists, um, neuroscientists, engineers, and uh, musicologists, and um, we are um, analyzing the acoustic properties of the of the um, sites and uh, doing conducting some psychoacoustic tests uh, to see how the emotions uh, could influence uh, these uh, rock art landscapes. And um, if you want to uh, know more about our uh, research work and our activities, you can visit our website or our Facebook uh, profile. Um, as I said, as part of our activities, we are organizing this seminar series um, in which we invite some speakers and researchers um, related with different aspects of uh, acoustics um, and today uh, we are welcoming uh, Helena Daffern. She is an associate professor at the, Univer uh, at the University of York, based in the audio lab in the um, engineering department. She obtained a BA and a MA degree in music and later a PhD in music technology in 2009 at the University of York. Um, as part as a um, fantastic researcher, she uh, is uh, a singer uh, trained at the uh, Trinity Eleven College of Music in London. And this uh, interdisciplinary background uh, put her in a, a perfect position to research on the voice science and virtual acoustics particularly in singing performance, vocal uh, pedagogy, choral singing, and singing for health and well-being. Um, Helena also formed and now is the director of the York Center for Singing Science, um, which is a platform um, for uh, research and teaching focusing in all perspectives of uh, voice um, and singing. Uh, techniques. Um, today's seminar entitled Virtual Choir, the uh, importance of a shared space in shared music making, explores how virtual reality uh, choirs uh, allow uh, singers to sing together even without sharing the same acoustic space, uh, the importance of that, and uh, always in a real-time convolution techniques. Now um, I leave the, the space to Helena to start with the presentation. Thank you, Lydia. OK, I'm going to mute my mic. You can start when you want. <laughs> so I haven't got the um, option to share my screen at the moment. Oh, maybe. Uh, to know if you're Dina or Marga, can I, you help with that? Um, you should. Um, do you have this um, purple button uh, at the bottom of 
the of your yeah. screen could you click on it yes. um, and yeah. then you have four options then you go to the square with an arrow mm -hmm. it's just kind of not letting me click let me try again oh. it's kind of great it worked earlier didn't it we tried it yeah. earlier it worked yes yes um, it worked yes let me oh let me just close that bit and try again. oh i think we might have some movement here we are okay great just don't panic that's the key isn't it yeah. there we go then you go to share screen right great great can people see that yes yes fantastic yes. Good. great fabulous you'll have to shout at me if you can't hear me or see something because i can't see any of you anymore that's um, fine don't worry but, uh, thank you lydia for that introduction and um yes i think the first thing i'll say is to highlight that i do i'm gonna kind of flit around a little bit in this presentation um representing my interdisciplinary background um i am a singer i'm interested in singing from lots of different perspectives um and the i can't really start this presentation without talking about covid19 which is a shame but i thought i'd get it out of the way at the beginning um so it's there on the slide in the middle there's coronavirus um the one of the good things to come out of it i suppose is that it's highlighted the fact that there are a lot of people who cannot be together to sing together, who might want to be, even in normal times. But certainly COVID-19 highlighted that for um, communities across the world. So, um, and it also meant that there's been a rapid kind of surge of research in this area. So I'm gonna touch on the Zoom effect. I'm gonna touch on virtual reality. I'm gonna touch on choral singing. Um, and virtual acoustics from different perspectives um, and i just want to highlight that the work i'm talking about today isn't all me um, i'm not an expert in all of the things that i'm going to talk about um, so it's thanks to all of my colleagues in the audio lab and beyond that we can do this research by bringing together expertise in different areas um, so i'm going to start with um, as i just said i wasn't going to go on about covid19 but i am going to start there uh, with a study that um, I conducted with colleagues during the first um, lockdown in the UK that took place in March 2020. It's hard to believe that I'm saying that in 2021 when we're just coming out of another one. Um, but what we wanted to do was survey choir members and choir facilitators, so conductors and directors, and find out what they were doing in order to maintain some sort of connection um, during the lockdown. So they weren't allowed to meet in person. Did they stop trying to meet? Did they try to use technology in a certain way? And so we um, sent out a survey which had a combination of um, multiple choice and open text um, survey responses. And then we analyzed the data. We got just under 4,000 responses from that survey and we analyze the data with a combination of quantitative analysis of the quantitative data, and then an inductive approach of thematic analysis of the open text responses to those questions. And I'm gonna to highlight today the bits that I think are particularly interesting in terms of virtual choirs and virtual acoustics. So two main models were tended to be adopted during that first lockdown. Um, and they were a live model that tried to do something in real time. Um, and this was split into two categories. One was the Zoom choir, which quite a lot of choirs tried. Um, they found very quickly that you cannot perform together as a choir over Zoom um, because the latency is far too large. I, I'm sure even just having conversations, we sometimes notice the latency. But if we consider that the standard um, for teleconferencing software that's using voice, so multimodal communication and the networks are generally aiming for a latency of about 150 milliseconds um, in order for us to have a natural conversation. Once we want to be able to sing together or make music together, um, it's thought that that reduces to about 30 milliseconds. So we can see that Zoom is not going to cut it. It's not going to do it right. So where Zoom choirs emerged, and you can see from the graph here, 
that um, we, we called the, the Zoom choir, so it might not be Zoom, there's lots of other teleconferencing software out there. Um, we called it live teleconferencing, that part of the model. And you can see um, on this graph that that was the model that was most mostly employed. Um, the other live version was to have a live streamed event. So it might be, I'm going to run my choir, but I'm just going to stream out myself. I can't see you or hear you. Um, I'm just going to run a session live and stream it on social media, for instance. The live teleconferencing system um, often became for choirs a social event. So it was they didn't try to sing at all uh, because they found it too difficult to try to sing together. And they often found it dispiriting to have to mute everybody. So you were essentially singing on your own. Um, so they often turned it into a social event instead. Um, and the stream session, they maintained some sort of social connection through messaging, through chat boxes, for instance. So the other um, model that was adopted was the multi-track choir, uh, which you may be familiar with, which has been a lot around for a long time, which Eric Whittaker um, kind of made really popular, which is where singers would submit a solo track of themselves recording that they'd recorded along to a backing track. They sent it back to their choir director, for instance, or there were big initiatives on online creating huge choirs. Um, and these solo tracks are mixed together to create a choral recording. Um, lots of singers likened this model to karaoke, uh, but there isn't so much of a social element with that model unless um, some choirs mixed the models together so they would meet on Zoom to have a chat every week, but the musical part of their choir became a multi-tracked model. From the responses, so that was that was kind of technically what they did. So that's what they were grappling with in terms of technology during that first lockdown. Um, and what we identified from the thematic analysis of the responses were six main themes coming out. And they were uh, participation, practicalities, and this refers to all of the practical elements of having to be online for a choir. And they're not all negative. So things such as I don't have a computer, my internet connection isn't very good, I don't know how to run Zoom, they all came up a lot. But as did this is brilliant because actually I can connect with that singer I used to sing with um, in Barcelona from York uh, and we get to kind of do something together again, which we would never have done under normal circumstances. Um, I don't have to go out in the bad weather. I don't have a drive to my rehearsal anymore. So it certainly wasn't all negative. There were positives about that as well. Uh, another was choir continuity. So often the reason that choirs had carried on was a very strong sense of loyalty, which um, actually aligns very well with a lot of the literature about why singing together might be good for your well-being you know, and social identity and sense of community are two very strongly connected themes with singing together in a choir face to face and they certainly came through during that first lockdown. And that's connected to people highlighting the well-being and social aspects of their virtual choirs. So, and again, there were positive and negatives to come out of it. So there was an overwhelming sense of loss of their real choir and choir rehearsals. Um, but the virtual models definitely provided a lifeline for many, many singers, um, especially in terms of providing some sort of routine in lockdown, uh, prevented them from feeling completely isolated. So again, highlighting these social benefits of being in a choir. Once we move away from the social elements and these kind of broader well-being aspects of the what the whole concept of being in a choir is, and everything that's involved in that from leaving your house to going to a rehearsal to going to a performance. Once we think about the actual musical elements, that's when the virtual choir models become generally more negatively reflected in the responses. So mostly speaking, 
um, in the responses, musical elements, it was musically less rewarding to be part of the multi-tracked version and certainly the live streamed. However, some people did say that it was a, a really beneficial learning experience that because they had to suddenly sing on their own, they couldn't be masked by other singers. It actually sometimes gave singers confidence. It sometimes highlighted to them where they needed to work on their technique. It gave them an opportunity to think about their voice in a way they hadn't before. So it wasn't, again, it wasn't always negative. But then there is this other theme, which was um, very strongly portrayed in the responses, which we've called uh, co-creation through singing. Now, it's um, very difficult to define what this theme is and um, actually participants found it very difficult as well. What they highlighted is that something is lacking. Uh, they talked about magic, the magic has gone. Um, you can't possibly feel the magic of singing together. Um, there were a few kind of delayed benefits in the multi-track model. So some people said, I didn't enjoy the process of singing in a multi-track choir. I didn't like recording myself, but when I heard it, when it was all mixed together, actually, that gave me um, a really a really positive feedback. It reminded me of what it felt like to sing it with that choir. And so they got a kind of delayed um, gratification of being together with those people from a memory. Um, and just a couple of quotes here that um, link in with acoustics, which I know is the, the thing that's particularly interesting to this group of people. Um, is that people started to identify that there's something about not being in a room together and it's not just about not being stood together but it's not sharing that space so your virtual model we can't blend together as voices we can't sing in harmony together and um, some people even identified that the acoustics don't work because we can't be heard together in the same space so we have we all miss the powerful swell of harmony that is experienced in a room with a large group of singers and choirs developed by the members singing together in, a, in real acoustics and adjusting to what each singer hears. So we're starting from this study to highlight what those ma that magic, they talk about that magic that they, they can't always put into words what it is that's missing. Uh, but it seems to be that, that it is missing, it, certainly in the current models that have, have been used. And there is no virtual model yet that can provide a solution to replace live singing. And that's not only based on what exists in the in the survey responses for us, but at the moment, even if these um, participants were cutting edge technologists, they couldn't come up with something that will replace live singing in a group together. On a basic level, singers need very little delay for real time interaction. So I mentioned that kind of magical number of 30 milliseconds delay. Um, so there is now a growing body of research in networked music performance um, and it is becoming easier to use that do solve these issues of latency. So Zoom is not the best answer. There are better things out there. Um, but certainly they weren't um, being used in the first lockdown in the UK. But singers need to adjust to each other to make harmonies and blend. That's really important to singers when they're singing together in a choir. It's one of the top priorities for why they sing in a choir. And they do seem to have a sense that they want to be in a shared space and that that's to do with the sound that they're making. Um, and some singers do really we're identifying that the acoustics were important i want to be sound i want my voice to blend with another voice in that space there is a growing body of literature now that's looking at music making and choirs um and what's been lost uh, through covid19 internationally um, and i'm sure more of that research will come out in the not too distant future often that focuses on these social elements and have they been um, retained um, Fancourt and Steptoe actually released a study before COVID-19 looking at virtual choirs, but that was the Eric Whitaker multi-track model. And they found that there were definitely potentially some well-being benefits. Um, they focused on social presence and identity in that study. Um, 
and Draper and Dingle, who just um, done another study of, of COVID, again, focused on the social um, identity aspects of and the sense of community that's found in the choir. But essentially what these studies are showing is that virtual choir models, they're better than nothing, but they don't come close to what is singing together in a room. So I mentioned that the NMP is, so networked music performance is a growing body of research. And this is just a, this is not by any means a comprehensive list of the software that's out there, but you can see, I just wanted to highlight, there is quite a lot out there. Um, it's not used extensively yet. A lot of it is open source, which is brilliant. And it is getting better all the time. Um, what none of these solutions can do is solve the uh, the issue of data needing to travel a distance on an internet. I do keep getting asked if we can have zero delay and the answer would of course be no. Um, and I want to just play you, if it works, um, an example of a choir that are a community choir in Suffolk. And they have just, they created the first Jack trip choir well, that we're aware of um, and so they did this um, by sending out raspberry pies to all of their uh, or the members that were willing to take part so they had two very um, techie members of their choir who were willing to set all this up they sent um, raspberry pies around to their choir so that they could sing together they can't see each other but they can sing together using jack trip so really minimizing that delay and on the radio pro program is here, so it can still be listened to. Um, and this is an example of them singing together. I just want to highlight before I play it, so that she says on the program that this is the first time they did it. So it's the first time they were trying to sing together over Jack Trip. Um, they're an amateur choir. Um, they sing together for fun, um, but they are loving using Jack Trip and it seems to be a really good solution to them. I'll just play you what the outcome of their Jack Trip choir is. Could you hear that? Uh, no, we didn't now. Um, it worked uh, before. <laughs> it, it, yeah, no, I tried. I tried to do something else because I didn't want to interfere with the audio without headphones in. But let me try again. So I hope you heard it that time. Yes. Yes. yes we did. <laughs> uh, so you can hear. So um, that's a choir who are an amateur choir used to being together in a space and they can't see each other at all. Um, if that had been a Zoom recording, it wouldn't have been that successful. That's certainly the case. Um, so what that doesn't do at all, that um, Jack Trip model, is provide us with anything other than this latency coping. So what the the kind of the focus of NMP research is to make that delay as small as possible. And it absolutely needs to be, because without that, we aren't going to be able to perform together over networks. But what that doesn't do is start to tap into what maybe some of this magic is of being able to share a space. So even if we had zero latency now on this call and we could sing together as a choir we would still be hearing ourselves through through our laptop or our desktop and in our kind of acoustic space that we're in would would we get that same kind of blended special sound now i'm going to go back a few years now uh, to a project that we've been working on in the audio lab for quite a long time for about five or six years which is looking at virtual reality choirs. So the purpose here is not to create real-time music making over networks, but can we create 
a plausible singing environment to become part of as an individual in isolation. So what we're trying to do here is, um, it is twofold really. One is to create a controllable and repeatable environment for research into ensemble singing. So for instance, if we can have a virtual reality singing experience where everybody apart from one person always does the same thing, um, then we can start to have a more controllable environment to look at micro level uh, interactions between performers. Um, for instance, looking at different acoustics and how they might impact singing performance. And of course, there's already research that shows that acoustics, uh, virtual acoustics do change the way that singers are singing. Um, so it, this is kind of a, to develop a tool for that purpose, but also to provide a means of access for people who cannot go to choirs in face to face for whatever reason to provide them group singing as an activity that we do know is beneficial to those people that it's that enjoy doing that so um of course that became far more relevant to everybody um about 18 months ago so what we were aiming to do with this first prototype of what we've called the Viva system was to create an immersive virtual environment for group singing, um, which allows you to hear and see the other singers in a virtual space, but also hear yourself in situ with the other singers. So in a given performance space, we would take impulse response measurements. And then in this model, we're delivering the audio over a loudspeaker rig. So you can see on the right hand side, we've got a rig. Our pink dot is our singer. And our audio input in this case will be a DPA microphone on the cheek. Um, and so we convolve the impulse response measurement that we've taken and then convolve that with the audio input from the singer so that we have that real time convolution taking place as they're hearing the other singers in that environment. And they do that um, via a set of recordings that we take of live singers in that given space. So we use an Eigen microphone, um, Eigen mic and uh, to third order ambisonics in the speaker rig and we used a GoPro 360 camera. This first version, we used a combination of Unity and Max MSP for the, um, for the audio processing. Um, we've, we've kind of used various iterations of this model along the way and an Oculus Rift headset. So what we have here, this is not quite the full system because when I did this video, our um, 360 rig was out of action. So we only have here the horizontal plane with the loudspeakers. But essentially what we have is you can see the singer with a VR headset and you can just see the, the microphone on her cheek. Now, if you look at the insert picture, you can see we have three singers and then the Eigen mic and the GoPro set up where this the the alto the singer in VR would have been positioned so what we had to do in order to make this um, virtual reality experience was record the group in this case it's a quartet missing a part each time so they sang as though the microphone and camera were the fourth singer and they had to imagine that she was singing so we needed um because it's one to a part four part singing um we needed to have musicians that could still sing the three parts with one part missing and from memory so here we have the alto coming back to fill in their part in this piece of music and i'll just play you that now
seeing that church with those singers. Um, it's worth pointing out that that takes quite a long time. We have to take impulse responses from each of those singer positions as well. So once we'd made this virtual reality um, environment, we set out to explore whether what we'd done was any good. And the research questions that we set for ourselves with this pilot study were, does the Viva provide an immersive experience of singing in a choir? So fundamentally, do they, do they feel that it's a plausible situation? Does singing with the others elicit a different response to singing alone and passively listening in the same virtual space? So what we did was we created um, an experiment with three conditions, singing on their own in the church, but convolving their voice with the acoustic. So they just sang solo, singing with the quartet, but singing a unison song, not the song you've just heard. So singing Amazing Grace in unison and then singing um, just just watching as an audience member. So watching the full quartet perform. Um, and we wanted to know whether this experience actually would encourage non singers to join in with confidence as well. So remember, one of the objectives of this is to take it round to people who don't go out and sing in choirs. Well, we were interested in can we encourage people to sing who maybe haven't taken up the opportunity because they're nervous, for instance. Um, in addition to just asking them um, kind of open questions and having dialogue with them about their experience of the VR, um, which is what we did with the four singers when they came back to try the virtual reality um, of themselves having recorded it. Um, we also wanted to take some other measures that are associated with um, kind of measures of bi biological, biophysical measures that are associated with singing already. So for instance, there's research about heart rate variability, skin conductivity, um, and we we're working with a neurologist who was looking at EEG data. Um, and also we took electrolaryngograph data to allow us to measure things like um, synchronicity um, between singers. And of course, we have the DPA microphone was necessary. So we have our three conditions of solo, chorus and just listening. And they did five repetitions of Amazing Grace in each condition. Before they began, they, we took a speech baseline measure and we had three minutes of measurement of just putting the equipment on the singers. So we're conscious that in once you put somebody in virtual reality, um, you're putting a lot of sensors, you're putting a lot of things on somebody. So we wanted to know what effect that was having as well. Um, so we're still in the process of analysing that data, especially the physiological data. Um, we had 22 um, singers that took part in the experience. Um, about half of them class themselves as intermediate singers um, and then about 40 percent advanced and 20 percent of them novices. Now going back to the research questions that we had at the beginning, does the Viva provide an immersive experience? Participants gave a very positive feedback to that. We asked a very simple question of did you feel immersed in the experience? Um, we had negative comments about the visuals so that they were a bit grainy that stopped it feeling like I was really there. Um, but generally they enjoyed the experience and said it was um, very, they used the term realistic. We need more data to think about what levels of immersion are really being experienced there. In terms of the differences between the three conditions, with the UWIS questionnaires, which assess through, through questionnaires that they tick very quickly and assess hedonic tone, stress and arousal, there's no striking differences across the um, conditions, although stress levels tended to go down over time through the experiment, which simply indicates that they were getting more comfortable with wearing the VR kit and with what was going on. 
they self-reported much greater relax relaxation in the listening condition. And whilst I haven't finished crunching statistics for the um, physiological data yet, there is some suggestion um, with things like mean heart rate that the listening condition was more relaxing than the other two, with little difference between the um, singing solo and singing in a group. Whether or not the Viva encouraged non-singers, uh, no, it didn't. So the novices felt um, that it was too, they said it was too realistic. It felt like we were singing with these really good singers and it was too intimidating. So it didn't work in that sense. So with that in mind, um, the limitations of that system were connected to non-singers not feeling intimidated by the the singers that we had but it's extremely time consuming creating just one virtual reality choir singing experience in terms of the time of the recordings you have to make impulse responses of every position and then the, the playback itself um, requiring one singer at a time to take part um, so we wanted to focus on improving access for less intimidating performance um, and so we worked with the National Trust and Keswick Museum and Dave Camlin, who runs Mouthful Voices, to create a community choir that would have fewer technical and time requirements, apart from the fact that we decided we did it outside in the hills of the Lake District to provide a kind of a beautiful backdrop and um, and a really spectacular visual experience as well, um, which had its own logistical complications, like um, dragging Genelex up a mountain in the Lake District. But um, we adapted the system for headphones so that um, everyone wasn't going to need to turn up with a 360 degree loudspeaker rig. And we created versions of this community choir for YouTube, which I'll show you in a moment. So this is the um, overview of the Viva 2 system, which you could argue that we um, we cheated a little bit here, um, but we will stick to our guns and say that we wanted it to be outside because of the atmosphere and the visuals and um, we knew we wanted to take this into care homes and residential homes for the elderly who often don't get to go outside beyond their, their garden and we wanted them to get to experience large landscapes but it did have the benefit um, and we did test it as you can see uh, Tom there checking the impulse response of the top of a hill in the Lake District and basically allowed us to not need the real-time convolution of the of the acoustic of the space. So we took that away for this experience. Um, very quickly, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and show you some of what we did here. So we now have a, um, a website which has lots and lots of VR choir material on it, which has been used in care homes in the UK and people can just go on and try it on YouTube 360. So as long as you're wearing headphones, you can then click on the mouse and drag around and it's head tracked immersive audio of singing in a choir. And I will show you what that looks like if you bear with me. So hopefully you can oh, see. Yes, yeah. I can see now. Yes. Great. So this is Dave Camlin running running the choir, and I'll just play you a little bit of them singing. And if you've got headphones on, hopefully you'll be able to hear the um the kind of the um the head tracking if I move around. And we all in time to a wild mountain time all around the blooming heather all around the blooming heather will you go la 
Brilliant, thank thanks. <laughs> Right, hopefully we're back. <laughs> yep. So, uh, so yes, that was that's kind of that was one of the examples of the videos from the website, and uh, and there's lots of them. Some of them are like that one where Dave teaches a song, so people can actually just sit and it's as though they're part of a choir rehearsal. Sometimes it's more of a performance, and you can just join in. We also have some um, choir performances in York Minster as well. So we've been taking those around. Um, people who don't have access to those things, this is before COVID, um, so that they can experience these things. And we had um, overwhelmingly positive responses. It's worth pointing out that in care homes, sometimes the elderly um, in particular were not keen on having headsets on, which is entirely understandable. Those that did enjoy it really enjoyed it. Uh, and those that didn't really didn't, I think is probably the best summary of that. Um, so with our um, Viva systems that we've created so far, we've got something that people are saying is plausible and immersive and enjoyable. Um, certainly the singers that made the first one, those four singers, they were, um, they couldn't believe that they thought they were singing with, they, they, they quickly said that, oh, it feels like we're really there in the space singing with them um, until someone goes wrong and no one reacts to it, and that's very strange. So we potentially have something in our virtual reality choir of what is missing from the networked music performance choirs at the moment. So maybe some of that magic we have in the virtual reality choir because, well, we think we're getting the acoustics nearly right, I would say. Um, but the major downfall to this model, of course, is that there is no bi-directional real-time interaction between the performers. You can only perform with this pre-recorded video. Um, so whilst you see all those singers interacting with each other and you can interact with them and your audio interacts with their acoustic, you're not going to get anything back from them. And of course, we know that's important. So can we have both? Can we have both of those things? Is, is that where we can get the magic virtually? So the work I'm going to talk about now um, is mainly the work of a master's by research student of mine and Gavin Kearney's, who finished his master's and he's now working on a PhD in this area, um, Patrick Cairns. And so he set out to um, see if he could design a Viva NMP system. So can we take our virtual reality choir and somehow make that real time over a network? Can we deliver real time acoustic simulation using NMP with spatial audio delivery, with three degrees of freedom, ideally, so that we can move within our space, under 30 milliseconds, well, which is the ensemble performance threshold, and I'm afraid that the reference for that has gone off the bottom of my screen, um, but it's in the reference list. So with the ensemble performance threshold um, has been um, identified as the amount of latency that performers performing together can cope with before they need to uh, start using latency coping strategies. So that might include an external metronome. It might include starting to slow down. So they can still perform together, but actually if you look at the, the synchronicity measurements or the tempi measurements or the mean slope of the tempo of their piece, they are gradually slowing. And that's actually this latency coping technique, which happens between about 30 and 80 milliseconds. Once we get beyond 80 milliseconds, then it's going to fall apart if we're trying to um, perform together in real time. Um, can we do this on home internet connections rather than in a lab situation? And is it achievable with limited technical knowledge? 
So I showed you that table at the beginning with these mu networked music performance solutions that, that don't seem to be being used by choirs. And the Jack Trick choir that have used it have actually created their own little Raspberry Pis to send out so that people don't have to interfere with their own computer. So these are what we aim to do. This is an overview of the audio system that um, Patrick created. Uh, and it's important to note that this is all done with open source um, materials. So we're using JackTrip in this iteration. Uh, we're using the OpenAir library for room impulse responses and the SADI2 HRTF database. Um, and I'm not going to talk you through that diagram because I'm bound to get it wrong. Uh, but uh, so Patrick is the expert in, um, in internet architectures and networks for this work. So Patrick created the system and then wanted to test it. And of course, we were sent into lockdown. So the testing had to become somewhat more um, real life based than lab based and controlled. So we set up five pairs of performers um, across different sites across Europe, measured the one way trip latency. Um, and again, just to remind you that for us to not require latency coping techniques, then um, we're hoping for latencies of less than 30 milliseconds. Uh, it required a setup tutorial of at least an hour with Patrick over Zoom. Um, everyone was plugged in to the internet, so no one was using Wi-Fi. Uh, everyone had over-ear headphones in. And what we did was create three different acoustic conditions. So a relatively dry um, room impulse response of the live room in the audio lab at York, a medium size um, performance space of the National Centre for Early Music, and a large performance hall of the Lady Chapel at St Albans Cathedral. You can see the, late, the estimated latencies that we got there and straight away you can see that okay two of our sites were within 30 milliseconds but the other three we're getting beyond our ensemble performance threshold and certainly Glasgow to Barcelona and Glasgow to Oslo we're going to struggle you would think. The performers were asked to repeat three performances of this piece, which you may recognize as Frere Jacques. And um, they sang to tar uh, in each of the virtual acoustics and provided responses to a questionnaire. We then also took performance measures. So we measured the tempo with both within parts and then the tempo ratio between the parts, with the asynchrony of the performance we measured the precision and then the tendency to lead. So one performer was assigned um, the server and the other was the client. We didn't swap them over. We then uh, used a questionnaire um, that was quite simple, that was drawn on literature on um, networked music performance. Uh, so asking about music, ex the performance experience, the tolerability of the delay that they were experiencing, the comparison to live music performance experiences, how, the musicality of their performance, emotional connection of the performance experience and the perceived synchrony of it. So I'm going to go over the results very briefly, just some of the things that I think might be interesting to you um, thinking about acoustics and virtual acoustics in particular. Um, the results are displayed in fine detail in the paper that's just about to come out in um, the AES journal. So um, synchrony was not found to be significantly affected by the room, so that is by which impulse response, or by group. Now when I say by group that also um, means across groups we're talking about latency. So we only have one pair in each latency. Uh, we don't have multiple latency values for each group, which of course would be ideal. The tendency to lead, um, the two groups with the, the highest uh, one-way trip latency had significantly larger tendency to lead times than the other groups. 
um, which does suggest that they were having to employ latency coping, st coping strategies, which is exactly what we would expect. But there was no effective room for any of the groups. When we looked at the mean tempo slope, um, again, this was affected by group as in the latency. So the higher the one way trip, the larger the mean tempo slope became. The mean tempi ratio, the higher the latency in the group, this caused a significant greater deviation from one. So, and for group B, as you can see in this graph, there was a significant effect of room. Now, I want to highlight the fact we don't have much data here. Okay, so we're dealing with five pairs and they've done three repetitions each. Um, so, so we're not dealing with much data, but certainly in the case of this group, it looks like they that room does play a part in their mean tempi ratio. So when we talk to them about their experience and from the responses of the questionnaires, we found that there were positive responses in terms of enjoyment, performer experience, um, and the kind of their reaction to the system was very positive. We can't ignore the fact that this could well be novelty. We haven't run this um, as a longitudinal study yet. Uh, so whether or not the more people do it, the, they still think that we don't know. But certainly they did show a preference to certain acoustics in discussion and through the questionnaire responses. Um, often they didn't like the studio, for instance, uh, found it too dry and preferred to perform together in um, one of the two other spaces. Um, there were also comments made about ease of synchronizing, immersion and voice separation. We don't have enough data to start to say whether or not this came out in the performance, um, but certainly it's um, something that's worth investigating in more detail in the future. So our Viva NMP system so far, um, where we're at with our testing, can we deliver real time acoustic simulation? Yes, and spatial audio delivery, yes. Three degrees of freedom in principle, but all our testing so far, um, we are relying on the fact that the other person's there and we can't see each other. And so we aren't implementing that at the moment. We have no head tracking involved at all. Can we get under 30 milliseconds for the ensemble performance threshold? Yes but it depends on the location. So we are, of course, going to add some latency with the convolution, uh, but it is minimal. And so if we have a good enough internet connection that's not, the data is not having to travel too far, then we can um, do this under 30 milliseconds. And we've been testing it on home internet. And we deliberately haven't been um, doing anything else. Um, it's achievable within te limited technical knowledge? No, it's not at the moment. Um, you need to be taken through the system as to how to do it, mainly because we're using Jack Trip it's, and kind of novice users find that difficult to do. Um, and so here you can see kind of typical Jack Trip interface. And that is starting to change. So we have this is Sonobus under here, which looks a bit more kind of user friendly, especially to Muztekas who are used to um, kind of interacting with DAWs. Um, so that is changing. But at the moment, it's quite a hard thing to implement. So in summary, where are we at with virtual reality choirs? Um, our pre-recorded virtual reality vocal ensemble experiences um, are potentially a valuable tool for research, especially understanding uh, how performers perform together because it allows us repetition and we can control environmental factors. So we can change the virtual acoustic, we can alter the visuals, but really time consuming workflows. Um, they have been well received by those who can't attend choirs. So even when the 
interactive audio wasn't there, so when we weren't using the microphone, people really enjoyed the immersive environment. So they really liked the fact that they can sit in the cathedral and hear a performance taking place um, in, in, immersive, in an immersive way. Uh, but much more testing is need, needed again. Does the novelty wear off? So we don't we don't know yet. We've we've only run studies of up to five weeks going back into repeated studies. So we're going to be running some of those studies in the next nine months. So our current real time virtual choir models, the teleconferencing software, the that's the the Zoom Skype choirs. They're not adequate. They're, they're not going to allow you to perform together unless you start looking at um, kind of creative ways of using the delay and latency for your own kind of aesthetic and make that part of your choir and performance. The bespoke um, network music performance software is improving all the time and can fulfill ensemble performance threshold requirements. So Jack Trip, Sonobus, Soundjack, they can all be within this 30 millisecond latency. So if people start to know about them and use them, of course, lots of them do not use visuals and hours included, but they are becoming easier to use. And the internet um, is improving, like bandwidth and speeds are improving for household users all the time. So what's the future for virtual choirs? Um, I believe that sharing an acoustic space in a virtual world is important for singing. So, and the study that we ran once singing together was taken away from people during COVID, that certainly is something that people are identifying as what was missing from their singing experience. So interactive immersive audio could improve network music performance experience. Might it help with latency coping strategies? for instance. Um, so if I expect the sound to have a long reverberation time, would that mean I could get away with um, slightly more latency? I'm not suggesting necessarily outside of the 30 millisecond threshold, but can it help us to deal with some of the technological issues of singing together online? Um, I'm sure that the, it will improve our sense of immersion and presence in the virtual choir, which was highlighted as being important, sharing this sonic experience together. Um, if we can get virtual acoustics to represent a space, a, a particular space that they share, then that will improve this. Could that go some way to bring back some of the magic of the shared physical space that is missing? Uh, during COVID times. And the ultimate question will be once the world opens up even more and choirs can meet again together face to face, is there a way of developing hybrid models that allow those people that still can't go to choirs face to face because they were never able to do so to join virtually and have a meaningful, magical experience? Thank you. Thank you. I don't know whether... Yes, Lydia, go ahead. <laughs> no, I just want to say thank you very much for this interesting talk. I was just impressed about how you control every single detail of the experiments and how you create a virtual reality environment. It sounds very complex. And uh, now I'm seeing we can open the, the time for questions and comments. I think that uh, Samantha yeah. wanted to talk and perhaps you can put your screen on, Samantha. I think that most of, of you can, um, and then Brian. Yes, so Samantha. Hi, I'm at home already, <laughs> sorry. Um, thank you so much, uh, Elena. It was really interesting. And at first when you started uh, talking about the um, strategies that uh, choirs uh, try to implement to manage the lockdown situation. I was, I mean, I felt that very relatable because I sing in choirs as well and, and 
<laughs> we implemented a mixed strategy of uh, Zoom meetings uh, mm -hmm. just for, um, uh, well, to talk and for uh, social gatherings. Um, and then the, the, the recording and uh, produced version of the songs uh, so we could keep singing. So, <laughs> uh, well, it was uh, it was pretty cool to see that very reflected. <laughs> yeah. So I have a, a couple of questions. Um, I um, I wonder if you have tested. Uh, well, you said uh, something like the magical number or 30 milliseconds latency, like a threshold. I don't know if it's something that you tested yourselves or if, if it's something present in the literature, or, and also if you know something about, um, well, um, studies of yours or from other groups, uh, testing if singers somehow adapt to the, to higher, maybe higher times of latency over time while singing. Do you know uh, something about it? That's a really good question. Um, really good question. Uh, so it's not it's not our research. Um, it's Sh it's Shoot's research in 2002. It was his thesis um, at MIT, I think it was, um, and he was looking at network music performance specifically, not specifically singing. And I think that that's a really really important piece of research that needs to be done. And before COVID struck, that was actually what Patrick Semres was going to be. <laughs> but uh, it requires us having sync. So what we were going to do was exactly try to look at whether singers can adapt um, differently to, to latencies over networks. But we need a lab and we need singers in it to be able to do it. And we're still not allowed to do that. So instead, we shifted the research and used the literature as our kind of thresholds and decided instead of finding out what our thresholds needed to be, we would do what we could do and see if they were good enough. <laughs> yeah, but you're, you're right, that research really needs doing. Mm. Oh, can you unmute? Samantha, yes, I've, I've uh, switched off your uh, microphone, so if you can switch it on. Oops, <laughs> okay, <laughs> now you hear me right. Okay, um, so, uh, I had another question. Thank you so much. <laughs> I had another question um, about the video uh, component of the of the virtual environment. And is it somehow you have a test? Well, I don't know much about the quality of of video in these cases, but I was wondering if you have tested somehow if um, the sense of reality would be even better without the video, just uh, rendering the audio and maybe with the like, eyes closed. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yes, again, we, uh, we have thought of that and it's, it's, it's another really good point. So I know nothing about video. All I know is how to put a GoPro up and then render the, the experience. Okay. But it certainly seems to me that the, the visual is not as good as the audio is what my, my instinct is, and that's what people say. Now, with our networked version, we don't have any visuals at all. Um, and research that I've done in the past um, with PhD student Sara DeMario, she looked at synchronization between singers. Now, that okay. would suggest that they can synchronize within 10 milliseconds. Um, but it also, she looked at visual contact and no visual contact. Um, so, so that kind of that indicates that singers they use visual cues. Certainly, that improves their synchronization. But I would think that if there's any delay in the visual, that will start to hinder it. So, um, an experiment that needs to be done. Uh, if anyone wants to take this on, um, if you're allowed to put singers in a lab, then would be to start to have a slight delay with your visuals compared to your audio because my guess is that actually you're better off with no visuals at all, rather than a small delay to your visuals. It's on our long list of things to do, but I at the moment feel like we may never get singers in the lab again. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, thanks. Thank you, Samantha. I think that, uh, Brian, yes, could you go ahead? Sure, sure. I think that, that actually hits, I don't know, can, can you hear me, is that working? 
I'm just making sure. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for the presentation. It's interesting that kind of that discussion that hit on exactly what I wanted to talk about and kind of what we were in the just in the middle of testing just a, a week ago, um, which was looking at getting how well can singers sing in a virtual acoustics, even disregarding kind of issues uh, of network latency. Uh, but just uh, we wanted to be able to record a a group of singers in the anechoic room, um, but have you know clean signals for each one. So the idea was just you're in one corner of the anechoic room and you're in the other corner of the anechoic room. And so these are um, middle ages polyphony uh, singers. So the idea was what what did they need to be able to to sing together and and what were the issues and it was exactly those kind of things so our first example was okay give each one a microphone and we'll put a camera in front of each one and each one can have a screen um not even network all on the same computer and and we just kind of went through a series uh, of problems so even that latency was too far because i think uh, kind of led to a question i wanted to ask was uh, like in the singing that you were that you're showing uh, with group singing, it seems to me it's very much a a lead singer and then everyone else is following and you're kind of looking at that as the latency. Um, whereas like in the example that we had, it seemed that each one needed to hear what the other one was hearing. So it really didn't take much latency for the whole thing to kind of fall apart. Um, and it wasn't just audio latency, it was visual latency in, in terms of like breath timing and, and things like that. So in the end, they actually needed to really see each other. So we ended up having to get rid of the cameras and basically lower our absorption just above like their nose so they could see each other. Uh, we had tried wireless headphones and the Bluetooth latency was too long. So we ended up having to go to wired headphones and everything just ended up being to reduce it as much as possible. So that was was kind of a question of how uh, how interactive was the singing you were doing and the requirement of 30 milliseconds, how much is that a function of the singing style? Because at least in, in ours, it, it seemed to be uh, kind, of, kind of much less than that. And then in your measurement of, of latency, which is a one-way trip latency, I was interested in how are are you taking into account the the sound card A to D latency in that because if you're starting to have multiple people all over the place I can't imagine they all have the same sound card and you're going to have variations on that um, but then and also the issue is is one way latency what you need to look at for this kind of singing where you actually I need to sing something that you need to respond to and I need to hear your response so instead of 30 milliseconds it's now it should be half that and that you're you're getting into virtually impossible even if they stand too far apart then it doesn't work uh in a real space and that's kind of what you even have in concert halls if if two musicians are too far apart they can't sit, they can't play together so putting that over the network is that's just a whole another kind of issue so uh, i just a number of things I, I wanted to throw out. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah, there's lots to unpick there, Brian, but if, or, yeah, all totally relevant, what you're saying. So uh, can I work, I'll work backwards just while that's in my mind about the one-way trip. Um, so it depends on the, the model that we use. So Patrick's created various different architectures depending on whether we're using a peer-to-peer -peer or a client-server model. And Lot, so the convolution can happen um, in in a central space, basically, so that it's not having to happen locally on everyone's sound card. So it happens. So so that we're we're essentially just sending one set of data. Um, and this is where I, I knew I said to you at the beginning, this is not my <laughs> so the, the internet stuff. You have to talk to Patrick about. But essentially. Um, the more singers that we have, the, the more latency we will have. Like, and so, so we, we just because of the processing that's got to take place every time we have to do a convolution of each singer's voice if they're going to be wearing 
a, a microphone. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, yeah, we're looking how do we scale it up? We've only used two singers at once. Well, we've done a few, we've done some tests obviously amongst ourselves with up to five um, and it does work. Um, but in terms of this magical 30 milliseconds, as I said to Samantha, we're taking that from the literature. It's not, it's not set up for singers. It's not that bespoke piece of research that needs to take place. We've measured synchrony between singers at far less than that, even, even when they can't see each other. The issue of the anechoic chamber, we've never had success in putting a group and then perform to their satisfaction in an anechoic chamber. There are so many things happening that are, are alien to the singers. Um, and then you make the really valid point that in real life, we often deal with latencies that are hard to cope with, that we have to find a latency coping strategy for. And I think a lot of when NMP is being thought about, we're aiming for this zero latency, we want zero delay, that would be very alien to any human, but we're never going to get it, obviously, so it's fine to aim for that. But actually, singers in particular are extremely good at latency coping. So if you have your singers in the anechoic chamber and they're struggling, you will probably find that if you leave them for half an hour, even less, they will very quickly learn how to deal with what they've got to deal with in terms of delay. And what they will do is they will either provide auditory cues to each other that they allow a latency for or a visual cue. And that's what we do. I mean, and, and that's what happens in normal performance. And I think what will happen with networked music performance is exactly that, but it, there'll be slightly different coping mechanisms based on the slightly different environment. So if you take a, a vocal group, say an, un, an unconducted vocal group and put them, they've been rehearsing in a studio, and then you put them in the nave of York Minster, they are going to very quickly change their performance and we know that the research you know is there is research out there that shows that um now with each of our virtual choir models has a different musical model and that's that's a really good thing to point out actually so our quartet that we started with that's a vocal quartet who are singing together with no leader so they are using whatever strategies they use in order to start together and know what their tempo is going to be, which is probably an auditory cue of breath and visual cues. But once we get onto the community setting, there is a there's a director who is leading the group, um, and that was deliberate because of the slightly different objective. But that's no, we're not measuring performance matrix in the ensemble. We're not. That's not the main purpose of that. It's not an elite group. Um, but once we're looking at the um the nmp system we we don't we don't designate a leader and follower but we do have a client and a server in terms of does that make sense so we're yeah, not yeah, yeah. saying you are leading this performance we're, we're just saying we want you to perform together we aren't telling them to have a leader and a follower now i'm not naively going to say there therefore isn't a leader because there clearly is, and the data, that's what that data shows. So we can map whether or not there is a tendency to lead or not. And the tendency to lead increases with latency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess the, the question is, is who, whose audio are you listening to, to determine who's leading and who's following? Since it's all interactive, then if I'm, if I'm listening, if, if the recording I analyze is that of, the server is different. You're hearing something different than what the client is hearing in terms of synchronization, because everybody has their own time scale um, yeah. because of the way the, the round trip latency works. Um, but I guess my, my comment about the, the, the kind of the, the system latency wasn't so much about the, the network issues. It's more the, the local hardware of each person issues. So if I'm using the internal sound card of my laptop, I have I may have a 60 millisecond latency just between the microphone and the speaker. Whereas if I have my high-end sound card that I crank up, 
you know, I could get five milliseconds. So even so that's why I thought that's what the question about your round your one way latency is 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 it a, I think it seems to me then that it's a measure of computer to computer latency, not audio to audio latency. No, because... it's measured in it's measured in Reaper uh, as the as a re right. the recording the audio that's recorded at each at each performer. Right, but in, so it's in yeah. That, that may be something just to look at because if yeah. you're claiming 30, 30 milliseconds from outside the sound card is is actually really small because if you look at like a high-end sound card if you get 10 20 milliseconds latency in and out is a really expensive sound card and like your your default built-in sound card is it won't do that and it may even vary over time uh, mm -hmm. on other on other issues and so that so I just just kind of beware of when yeah. you're is it a is it a network latency or is it a in to out latency? Um, yeah. Just to be just to be clear on that, because for example, for the video, we couldn't get anything under a hundred milliseconds. We and, haven't, we haven't and, and you're just standing next to the camera, <laughs> clapping your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the audio yeah. is about like that too. Yeah. So I wish Patrick was here to to confidently answer <laughs> this question, but he isn't. But um, but. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So I certainly know that he um, took all of the hardware information. Um, so from from what all of our performers had. So I'm pretty sure he broke down all of the all of the time travel needed along each step of the way. But I don't know whether those um, out final latency. Yeah, is it acoustic to acoustic latency or audio to audio latency? Yeah, yeah. My yeah. guess is it's audio to audio. Yeah, you're measuring it. Yeah, because certainly our performers performed without latency coping when that value was near 30. So if it was higher, they were still managing to perform without any latency coping strategies. So yeah. that would be yeah. really yeah. interesting because that would suggest that singers can. In fact, these were not even, you know, I mean, they were singers, but they weren't professional singers. They were just people who sing in bands and things. So that would suggest they can cope with even higher. And I would suggest that singers are, that there are, they have a, a wide range of different techniques available to them because of what the voice can do. So when, and it's one of the dangers of using these thresholds like 30 milliseconds, because usually they're done on either clapping. So the onset will be very particular that these things have been measured on. And we know that voice onsets are so variable and we use that as latency coping. I'm sure we do. Um, yeah. So we will we will alter our onset or use a plosive consonant to our advantage and say I'm going to put my plosive, I'm going to put my release stage here and hope that my, you know, my phonation begins at roughly the same time as yours. And no one will know. You know, we do that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I think I think that both your guess, experience. Uh, uh, will be extremely useful for our project because we wanted also to do some anechoic recordings and so on. So I think that uh, we will be knocking on your door, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or on your computer, I guess, uh, to ask you for uh, advice. Uh, that's uh, advice. I think that we will we will do certainly um, Samantha and and Lydia, <laughs> I guess, yeah. So that's that's great. Uh, um, uh, Hel Helen, I wanted to ask you something very different. There's something I mean, it's probably you are not an um, expert on this and I am not an expert either. But you were saying that you were doing some um, neuro um, um, uh, neuropsychological, um, you know, sort of measuring things. But mm -hmm. my understanding is that people cannot move. So how how were you doing it? Oh no, they could. So I don't know anything about this. Um, so I just I work with a neurologist and he does it all. Uh, but no, it's a it's a it's like a cap. So it's not a cap. It's a oh, what's um? It was like a band, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a, a webbed thing. I was wondering if I've got it in my office. Um, and it sits on your head. There's electrodes on the end of um, kind of like spider's legs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they sit on your head and oh. now you can move around all right um, in fact that the piece of the kit kit that we use it's an emotive it's called 
and it's it's designed the neurologist that i work with has people wearing them all day and going for walks in the environment oh, so yeah that's very interesting i think that mm -hmm. yeah there, there will be uh, another member of the of the project probably contacting you about uh, about this because my understanding was that you needed to be in the lab um, in order to carry on all these um, tests so that's brilliant. I would, yeah I would imagine it will depend on what you want to find out so yeah. if you want I don't know a certain type of information then I'm sure you'd need probably a full fMRI or something yeah. but for for this is kind of which parts of the brain are, are, are doing what I, that's all I can say that's very expert of me isn't it yeah. which parts yeah. of the brain do what <laughs> So um, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, let me see because there's some. Um, yeah, um, let me check the the chat. I know it's everybody's. Thank you and very interesting and so on. So, if there isn't anybody else um, willing to ask, uh, perhaps uh, Lydia, could I ask you to um, to say the last um, words? Uh, yeah, I had a lot of questions about the latency and everything, but they have already uh, somehow uh, answered. Somehow I have new questions <laughs> after your conversation. So um, just I just want to say thank you very much uh, for, for accepting the invitation. And I'm sure I'm going to follow those projects. I'm really interested in them. And you are doing a lot of things with... Uh, complex setups and everything so i hope to read more soon so thank you very thank much thank you for having me thank you it was a pleasure <laughs>